Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Today's focus is on flashing yellow arrow at intersections. On behalf of the Illinois Department of Transportation, I'm Bill Vavrick with ARA, and I'm pleased to be your moderator today for the webinar. I'm a principal engineer with ARA who works as a consultant to IDOT's Bureau of Research in deploying the products of IDOT's research program. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. When you join today's webinar, you selected either phone or computer audio. If for any reason you would like to change your selection, you can do so by accessing your audio panel in the control panel. There are two ways for you to participate. You'll have the opportunity to participate in four polls throughout the webinar. Please make your selections promptly, as, and we will publish the results for you to see. You will also have the opportunity to, to submit questions to today's presenters by typing it into the questions pane of the control panel. You may type in your questions at any time. We will address all of the questions during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. So let's get started with our first poll. The first poll question, which should be coming up in front of you now, what is your affiliation? And your choices are Illinois DOT, FHWA, local government, contractor or consultant, or other. So please select the appropriate response and hit the submit button. And we'll wait just a moment while everyone finishes that up. And looks like um, most folks are in, so thank you very much. And you can see that a good number of our folks are Illinois DOT, uh, with local government uh, another third, and contractor and consultants also with a with a second with a third of the thirds there. So uh, we've got a good representation from all interested parties, and we're looking forward to providing you with some great information today. Our next question is: What district are you located in? So the options are District 1, 2 or 3, 4 or 5, 6 or 7, or 8 or 9. Clearly these are the IDOT regions. Uh, please, if you would, uh, chime in with your vote so we can understand geographically uh, the attendees of today's meeting throughout the state of Illinois. It looks like uh, most everybody is in. so. Uh, we've got about nearly half the folks out of District 1 and then evenly spread through the remainder of the districts uh, with a good representation uh, throughout the state. So thank you very much for that. Helps us understand who the folks are that are participating on the conference. The next one today is a bit of a quiz, if you will, to get things started. And that is a question, what percentage of crashes do you think are associated with left turns? Is it 0 to 20, 21 to 40, 41 to 60, 61 to 80, or more than 80% of the crashes? So what percentage of crashes do you think are associated with a left turn? Please hit the uh, your response and then hit the submit button. Looks like we got some good voting going on right now. People honing in on what they think their answer is. Looks great. All right. Looks like the answers are about to come up. As you're about to hear from our first speaker, studies show that approximately 27% of all intersection crashes in the U.S. are associated with left turns, with more than two-thirds of those occurring at a signalized intersection. So the correct answer was 27%, and a good number of you got it right. Uh, that's a tough question to ask before we really get started. So now we'll be moving on to uh, a little bit more information about our webinar today. For those of you who have registered and are online, uh, we will be issuing PDH certificates. Um, we do thank you for, for your participation. The PDH certificates will be emailed to you, uh, and you'll receive your certificate for the amount of time that you were on the call uh, as the system monitors the on-call time. Only those participants who are registered 
will be eligible to receive a certificate. And you can expect that these will be emailed to you in about one week's time. An overview of our topics today. Uh, I'm giving the uh, welcome and introduction right now. Randy Laniga from IDOT will be talking a bit about the history and planning, followed by Paul Grant talking about design and installation. Brian Williamson about outreach. Randy's going to wrap it up with a couple of lessons learned, and then we'll do our Q&A session at the end. All right, so that's our overall agenda for today. And now I'd like to take just a moment to introduce the three speakers who will be bringing the uh, presentation material to you today. Uh, our first speaker is Randall Laniga. Randy is a graduate of the University of Michigan, where he received a bachelor's and a master's degree in civil engineering. He's worked for IDOT in District 4, Peoria, for over 35 years. The last 24 years, he's been the design and planning engineer for traffic section of operations. His position includes being the ITS, Intelligent Transportation Systems Coordinator, and the Safety Committee Chairman for the district. Our next speaker will be Paul Grant. Paul served four-year apprenticeship with the IBEW, graduated in 1980. He started to work on traffic signal installation and maintenance in 1984, working for Bud Ruff Electric and Laser Electric until 2000. He received IMSA Level 2 certification in 1987 and started working for IDOT in 2000 as a traffic signal technician. Our third speaker is Brian Williamson. He's a spokesperson for the Illinois DOT and has a passion for effective communication. Brian serves as a media liaison for IDOT manages the department's social media channels, prepares news releases, and produces videos. Brian began his career in 1998 in television broadcasting, working at the ABC affiliates in Springfield, Illinois, Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, before moving to government public relations field in 2006. After spending a year in public as the public information officer for the city of Myrtle Beach, he began working for the state of Illinois in 2007 and has served in his current role since about 2009. So now we'll jump right into our technical information. I'm going to hand the microphone over to Randy to talk about the history and planning of Flashing Yellow Arrow. Randy? Thank you, Bill. And I'll get this going here. First of all, I want to talk a little bit about the history of flashing yellow arrows and why we got going. Um, one of the things a lot of people ask me when we talk about the flashing yellow arrows is why are you making the change? I mean we've been using traffic signals with just the red, yellow, green for um, many decades. Why the change now? Everybody's used to it. You know, how can, uh, how can this help? Is it going to be more confusing? And um, what I like to tell them is, you know, as, as uh, safety engineers, we're always looking to improve things. And, and just in the last decade or so, we've really been looking a lot more at human factors. Why people drive the way they do and, and what do they need. And um, so when traffic engineers and safety guys started looking at the left turn, as you saw from that first slide, we do have a lot of uh, left turn crashes and they can be very serious. When somebody turns left into um, opposing traffic and gets that T-bone crash, they can be very serious. You know, rear end is probably the top crash, but it's not, we don't get the injuries and fatalities like we do with this left turn crash. And so we've always been looking at ways of, and trying to improve this. And what we noticed was for that left turn, for that permissive move, when he can make that move but he has to yield to traffic, the indication we're giving him is a circular green. And for circular green, everywhere else it means go, but for that left turner, it means yield. And so we're giving conflicting messages. And so for younger drivers, older drivers, that driver changing the uh, radio station, eating his Big Mac, whatever distracting it is, um, you know, all of a sudden they look up, oh, I got a green light, I can go. 
and that's where we were getting those uh, crashes. So the first thing we want to do is improve safety with this flashing yellow arrow. We wanted to give an indication, a traffic signal head that was just for the left turner. So he didn't have to worry about any other traffic signals. They just had to worry about their left turn signal. So how did this, um, you know, who thought of the flashing yellow arrow? Well, it actually happened in the, back in the late 90s when a number of states said, hey, we got to try something different here. And they tried the flashing yellow arrow. They tried flashing circular red. They tried flashing uh, red arrows. And they all got permission, of course, from the FHWA, hey, we want to try something to reduce crashes. Well, we found out that every single one of these helped reduce crashes. Well, then the FHWA said, well, wait a minute. We have to um, find out which way is the best because we want to have it the same way across the country. We don't have every state doing uh, their own thing. So that's when we did NCHRP, the study NCHRP 493. And what that did is actually that was mostly in simulators uh, where you sit in the car and you have the screens in front of you. And they tried all different scenarios. They used thousands of people went through and tried all the different scenarios. And this is a study that showed that the flashing yellow arrow was the most recognizable as being um, an indication to yield. And it was even better than what the circular green was. More people understood this than the way they've been driving. And so um, they said, OK, now let's take this out in the field. And that started in CHRP uh, study 123. And that study started showing a reduction in crashes um, almost right away. So even before that study was done, we got an in interim um, approval from the FHWA in 2006. And then it's included as an option in the uh, 2009 edition of the MUTCD. So what advantages uh, did these studies show? Well, first of all, it showed it provided an exclusive display for the left turn control. So now the person turning left doesn't get additional signals for in the old time, it had that circular green, the circular red. Now it's going to be an all arrow display. And they're going to have their own display telling them exactly what to do. And second, like I've already told you, it reduces uh, the left turn crashes. Now the next one is it eliminates the left turn trap for lagging lefts. Now in Illinois, because of the left turn trap, we've only been using uh, leading lefts for the protected permissive phasing. And what? And if, if I don't know if everybody understands what a left turn trap is, but using a lead lag left would mean for one direction you would lead the left turn. It would start out with the uh, with the through movement for let's say northbound. And then both through movements would go. And then afterwards, we would stop the northbound movement. And the southbound movement would then get the green arrow. So the green arrow for the left turn would lag after the through movement. And the reason we do that is for better progression. You know, your platoons always don't show up at the same time when you're trying to progress traffic. And if you can adjust those left turns, you can get better progression. Well, what that does, however, in the old style, is the le that left turner may be having that green ball, and all of a sudden it goes to red, and they're out there in the middle of the intersection, but the opposing green are still coming through. So it would trap him in the middle of the intersection. He'd have a red light, but he'd have nowhere to go because that green, the, the other through movement would still be coming through. And we'd get a lot of crashes because of that, because they would watch their signal see it to yellow, assume the opposing traffic was getting a yellow, and pull out into traffic and, uh, and get hit. 
So that's why we've never used them before. But now they're going to get that flashing yellow arrow through the with the opposing green. So they know they can be out there and they can wait for a gap or wait till it goes to yellow when the opposing one it will also turn to yellow. So the report said, hey, it's going to help eliminate that left turn trap so you can use lead lag phasing for better progression. And I'm going to talk more about that at the end and lessons learned because we, we did a study on that. We did try that also. Um, finally, uh, another thing it does is it increases capacity. Um, you can run that, the flashing yellow while your through movement is red. Before you couldn't do that, you couldn't have a permissive move with your through movement red, but now you can because it's tied to, to the opposing green. So you get a little bit more uh, capacity. Um, it can be used in different phasing schemes. Now that the left turn has its own signal, you know, by time of day, and we've done this also, let's say that the uh, peak hour is real heavy, we don't want to use the permissive move, it's too dangerous, so we can run it protected only during the peak hours, and we can run it protected permissive in off-peak um, hours. So it's a different phasing scheme you can use. And then finally, it promotes a nationwide consistency for a protected permissive display. So now across the country, we'll all use the same method. Now, as you notice, the MUTCD gave it as an option, so not everybody is using it. But um, right, now, uh, right now, all 50 states are using it somewhere. Okay, so certain states, like I know Oregon, has already changed the, the whole state out to uh, flashing yellow arrows. I heard a pre presentation by the um, safety engineer who did that, and he says it's a silver bullet. Because usually, when you're safer, it decreases capacity, and you got to fight those two. He says this one not only is safer, but it increases capacity. And he says it's uh, it was a silver bullet for him, and he was real happy with uh, with the results. Okay, so how did it start here in uh, Peoria? Well, I'm originally from Michigan, so I get back home once in a while, and I saw that they were using that circular red up there, and I thought, boy, that's a great idea. And so I came back to Illinois and went to the central office and I said, hey, I want to do a study with this also. And they said, no, won't let you do it. So then they did that study, NCHRP123, and wanted um, different locations to, uh, to join in the study. And the city of Peoria actually did. They had two locations with the flashing red arrow that they tried. And, uh, but again, my request was turned down by the central office. Well, when it got into, well, then next, a few years later, um, I had to give a couple depositions at, um, for a couple fatal crashes that happened at a couple of my signalized intersections. Now. Some of you traffic engineers know you get called into these depositions and you explain how the signals work and then the lawyer says, well then who had the green light? And we say, we don't know. We weren't there, we didn't see it. We can't tell you how it worked. But on these two depositions, with what the witnesses said, what the driver said, I was able to uh, tell them that yes, those people had a green ball not a green arrow. They both claimed to have a green arrow, but they didn't. They both confused it. They had just pulled into the left turn expecting that green arrow, but it, because they kept so late, they only got the circular green, and they pulled out in, in front. So that's when I uh, went back and I got a safety project approved um, through, the, uh, through our Department of Safety. So we did. The, we started off with two major projects. At first, I thought I was going to have to change out all the controllers, all the cabinets, and it was going to be a very expensive uh, project. And so I uh, put in nine hundred thousand dollars just to do Illinois 40 and US 150 here in Peoria. Well, then we got. After I got approved, we started 
doing the design work, meeting with the manufacturers, and we had some pretty new equipment out there and found out we could modify it to make it work. So I saved a lot of money on that project, so I was able to add all of the state routes in the tri-county area, so it included Peoria, East Peoria, and so on, all the way to Morton. So I got all of the um, tri-county area here around Peoria switched out um, with a safety project. Since then, we've done um, multiple small projects in towns with just one or two signals and uh, got the major towns of Galesburg and Macomb and Alito done. So now we have over 150 intersections with flashing yellow arrows and um, so it covers our uh, entire district. Okay, so what does a traffic signal head look like with flashing yellow arrow operation? Well, the top signal head is red, the red arrow, which means stop, just like everywhere else. Then the solid yellow, which indicates that the traffic signal will be turning red. Then you have your flashing yellow arrow, which has replaced that the circular green for the left turn, which means turns are permitted, but you must first yield to oncoming traffic and pedestrians. Then proceed with caution. And then, the, of course, the solid green arrow, which means that you have the right of way. You may uh, turn left. Oncoming traffic has, uh, has stopped. OK, so when you do your planning and you want to put in some traffic signals, uh, where are you going to start? Well, first of all, you got to determine the extent of your improvements. Um, one of the things we took a look at first off was we said, hey, you know, let's do our high crash locations, the, the intersections we're having problems with. But then we realized that it was just going to be spot improvements throughout the city. And so a driver is going to see different type of um, signals as they go down the road. So I would suggest that you start with a corridor and uh, change out a corridor first and do all of the uh, and do all of the intersections. Uh, the next question is uh, protected permissive versus protected only. When we started out, we only did intersections that were protected permissive um, and that's when we switched them out. And the question came up, what about those intersections that are protected only? Is it going to be that much safer that we can, that we can go to uh, flashing yellow arrows and make a protected only intersection a protected permissive? Well, in our first uh, branch out, we didn't do any of that, especially if it's a double left. We're going to keep all of those um, protected only. However, we had a few intersections that were T intersections. And at those T intersections, we had a big buried left turn. And so that left turn turner would get in there. They'd be looking straight across the street and get that circular green. And, that, and we had such a problem with crashes, we had to go protected only. So we wondered, hey, we can go flashing yellow arrow here and, uh, and, see what, uh, and see what happens. And we had, on a couple of them, we had very good success. And uh, on one of them, we had to revert back because of sight distance problems. And I'm going to, when I wrap this up, um, talk a little bit more about sight distance and how that, affect, how that affects uh, the use of the flashing yellow arrow and the lead lag phasing and, uh, and so on. Uh, so with that, that uh, finishes up my part. We'll turn it back over to Bill for these poll questions. Very good. Thank you, Randall. Appreciate it. Let's take a minute to uh, get some feedback from our audience. Uh, please participate in your first poll, which is up right now, which is, what is your experience level with flashing yellow turns, with your skill level choices being beginner, medium, or expert? So please select the appropriate response and click Submit. And we'll wait for those uh, Q&As to come in. Again, uh, I, I put a 
message in the chat pod, but please remember if you have any questions, enter them in. I've got a couple of them come in, come in already. Uh, we'll happily take those Q&As uh, at the end of the presentation today. Looks like we've got that pretty well wrapped up now, and you'll see that most of our folks, 74% are uh, at the beginner level uh, with a few experts on the line. So good to have a, a great diverse group of experience. Our next poll question, this helps us understand how we're getting out to you and how we can get you more information about future webinars that IDOT will be putting on, and that is how did you hear about this webinar? So was it IDOT's website? an email invitation, Facebook or Twitter, word of mouth, or something else. So if you would, uh, just click in and, and hit submit on that, whether it's uh, whatever your method was that you learned about this webinar. We hope to be bringing you more webinars in the future on timely topics uh, that will make your lives better, and we need to know how to reach you. So it looks like the responses have started to slow, mostly come in now. The response rate's slowing down. And email invitation appears to be the, the primary way, and we will make sure that we've got good email lists and get those emails out to you. Uh, obviously, we'll keep up on the, the DOT website as well as, uh, you know, you see word of mouth is still pretty popular there. Please, when, if you would, when you have an opportunity, let folks know about these webinars, uh, that they can join in, send them a link, uh, let them know that these are available uh, so we can get the word out on the great things that are happening within IDOT. Next up is our discussion of design and installation. So this will be Paul Grant's going to talk a bit about uh, what it takes to design and install your flashing yellow arrows. Paul, you want to take it over and uh, advance your slides. Can you hear me? We got you. Okay, welcome everybody to this section. We're going to talk about what was involved in uh, designing the modification from protected permissive five section head to the flashing yellow at about a hundred different intersections. So we'll be talking about some important things like signal head placement, number of signal heads, cabling challenges we had, what we had to do as far as rewiring the cabinets if they were even usable, and what new equipment we had to put in those cabinets. The first issue, and maybe one of the, the major ones if you're doing a conversion, is out of the 2009 MUTCD 4D1307. Before we talk about that, we should define what the MUTCD means by a separate signal face and a shared signal face. The shared signal face is what we've all been used to. That's the five section head. It's shared because it has two phases present in one head the through movement and its adjacent left turn. The separate signal face, which is what we use for the flashing yellow arrow, means just that. It's only that phase, and in the case of the flashing yellow arrow, it's four sections. But what this section of the MUTCD is stating in plain English is that separate signal face, the primary one for flashing yellow arrow, shall be located somewhere between the projected lane lines of that exclusive left turn phase. You can also add an, an additional signal head, like on the far left for auxiliary control. The reason this is a big issue is your mast arm length. If your mast arms aren't long enough to position that head somewhere in that lane line, you're going to be required to replace them. That could also mean, in most cases probably does, a new foundation. So this is going to raise the cost of the modification exponentially. Fortunately, in District 4, for quite a few years, we've been doing all our designs with mast arms long enough to satisfy this. So we had to replace very few mast arms, and that certainly helped with our budget. And just as an aside, the same section of the MUTCD also discusses, under guidance, what to do if you're continuing to use the five-section head with a circular green. And they say that head should not be located anywhere over that exclusive left turn lane. Our next issue had to do with MUTCD 4D1101, which talks about the number of signal heads required, primary signal faces for the through movement, which is two. In the past, where we had one through lane and one left turn lane, 
we would use that five-section shared signal face to satisfy the requirement for the two heads. Well, now that you're converting that to a separate signal face for flashing yellow arrow, you're going to need to add an additional head for the through movement. We normally satisfied that by using a far left or far right head on the upright. Of course, if you had two through lanes, you could simply add another head on the mast arm if the loading requirements were sufficient and have one centered over each through lane. One issue we ran into when we were doing the design here in District 4 was our cables. Our st standard procedure would have been to run a single seven conductor cable out the mast arm to that shared signal face, had enough conductors to take care of both the through and the left turn movement, and then we would just simply put some jumpers back to the other two heads. Well now when we were going to flashing yellow arrow, that seven conductor no longer satisfied the requirements. So we had to add an additional cable. We repurposed the seven conductor for the flashing yellow arrow head and added additional five conductor cable to take care of the through movements. This could be an issue if your intersection had undersized conduit where you could not add additional cable or if the condition of the conduit was such that you weren't sure you could pull cable in, which means you might be pushing additional conduits or some other high cost solutions. Now we had to come up with a pay item, a way to rebuild the existing signal heads. More of a problem if your shared signal face was five section. Sometimes we had a four section signal face that used a dual mode arrow in the bottom that was an easy change. All they had to do was change the balls and the dual mode arrow out to all arrows and do the rewiring. But if it was a five section head, we found the contractors had to take the head down, modify it, modify the bracket and the back plate, as well as replace all the LEDs. And from experience, after seeing a couple of these projects, we came to realize that the price for the modify really wasn't a lot different than the price of a new signal head and brackets backplate would be. So in the future, we'd probably be well advised to just replace everything we can with new and you get better equipment, less age on it, and longer life in the future. That pretty well takes care of field things, but now we have to talk about the cabinets. Something that makes flashing yellow arrow unique is the fact that each phase requires four outputs. In the past, controllers, circuits, everything in the cabinet was designed for three outputs, red, yellow, green, or in the case of the PED, just the walk and don't walk. But now we had to create a virtual four position load switch and controller circuit in that cabinet, which meant two different load switches were going to be doing the function of flashing yellow arrow. Another thing that's different is the yellow change arrow is on at two different intervals in the sequence after the green arrow and after the flashing yellow. So they have different requirements as far as what they can be on with at the same time. So that required a controller and an MMU that were intelligent enough to do this and also to uh, keep it out of flash when the, when the arrow came on at different times. Now we worked with two different manufacturers, primarily Eagle and Econolite, and we'll talk about Eagle first. They do things quite a bit different. Eagle uses what's called the separate green arrow method. That means the left turn green arrows are always by themselves. They can be on a load switch exclusively, or sometimes they're placed on the unused yellow of the uh, pedestrian load switches, depending on whether it's a 16 or 12 position back panel and how many phases you have at the intersection. So basically, the flashing yellow arrow the solid yellow arrow and the red arrow are always by themselves on a load switch somewhere. And that green arrow, as I said, was either alone or on the unused bed yellow. Now in order to do this, TS1, TS2, it was a little different. So TS1 cabinets required a fair amount of wiring on the back panel. The TS2 cabinets, it was mostly done in the uh, controller software with uh, output reassignments. We were pleasantly surprised to find out we could use our existing M40 or M42 controllers with a firmware upgrade to version 333 or later, as long as they were a large memory controller. Or we could purchase a new controller, which at the time was the M52, 
and then we had to uh, use EDI's MMU 16LE MMU regardless of whether it was a TS1 or TS2 cabinet. So that was a, a cost savings. We didn't always have to buy a new controller, but looking back on it now and five, six years on into the, uh, the project, I would recommend replacing the controller. The M42 is a good controller, but it does require replacing EEPROMs in order to do the upgrades, and also it has no capacity to transfer the uh, controller program through a data key or a flash drive. So since it's a rather complicated programming of the controller, it's a good idea to have an easy way to transfer it to a different controller if need be. Also, another thing that has changed since we originally did this is the MMU2 standard that NEMA has developed. And that took everybody's different flashing yellow arrow modes and came up with a, uh, a letter type for each one. That means now that you could use an EDI MMU or a Reno MMU probably in anybody's flashing yellow arrow design. The only thing that you couldn't change are the memory cards in the, in the MMUs. Now the Econolite took a little different approach. They used what they called the separate flashing yellow arrow approach. In this case, the green arrow, yellow arrow, and red arrow were always on the load switches where traditionally the left turns were, one, three, five, and seven. And the flashing yellow arrow was always been placed on the unused pedestrian yellow. This held true across TS1 cabinets, TS2 cabinets, and all the iterations we had. Of course, if you're one of the uh, districts that always had your EVP beacons on the unused ped yellow, they're going to have to be moved. In the case of a 16 load bay, they put them on 13 through 16 red. If it was a 12 load bay, they may have had to install an additional load switch separate from the back load bay. It was good to have this system because that meant every cabinet was the same and it did reduce a little bit of the back panel wiring in the TS1 cabinets as compared to Eagle. We did, however, have to buy new controllers. The ASC3 was out at that time and they were able to set it up to do the uh, flashing yellow arrow, so we had to get one of those for each intersection. And initially the Reno MMU 1600 GE and as I said, now with the MMU2 standard, you could use EDI, Reno, or I would assume other manufacturers also. And that includes the part I was going to talk about. Very good, Paul. Thank you very much. I am glad that there are uh, folks who understand the wiring, the boxes, the mastheads, the, the signals like you, because as a civil engineer uh, listening to your discussion, uh, you, you certainly went beyond my no level of knowledge, and I, uh, I appreciate the, the hard work that you guys do to, to really make this work in the field. Uh, that's certainly a key part of making Flashing Yellow Arrow uh, a success throughout Illinois. Our next uh, presentation is going to be by Brian Williamson, and Brian's a spokesperson for IDOT and is going to talk a little bit about the messaging of Flashing Yellow Arrow and how to get that messaging out. Brian? All right. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, everyone. Hey, so uh, so get this. There's something brand new coming your way, okay? How does that make you feel when you hear that? Um, you know, you might be a little excited about it. might be a little nervous about it. Maybe you're actually not too happy about it. I don't know. I mean, let's face it. New things that, uh, you know, come out there, they often take us outside of our comfort zones a little bit. Um, you know, sometimes they actually really don't go over very well in the case of anybody remember back when Coca-Cola came out with new Coke back in the uh, 1980s. That one, that one didn't really pan out so well. But uh, the other end of the spectrum of that, of course, maybe a few of you are familiar with these devices, probably sitting about a foot and a half away from you. The iPhone, you know, that came out there, and that was a brand new deal. And a billion sales later, I'd say they're uh, probably doing okay there uh, at Apple. So you know, no matter what it is, though, when you do come out with something new. Uh, it's important to get the word out about it, and that definitely applies to flashing yellow arrows as well. Um, this was a new thing in this area, a new technology that uh, people in the area weren't used to. They weren't used to driving near, weren't used to encountering, and so we were tasked with making sure that everybody was on board with it, that people were aware that it was coming, um, and getting the word out about these new signals, both before they were installed, um, and then after they were installed as well. And so to that end, uh, when you have 
a, uh, a traffic signal there. Of course, it doesn't just impact the, the drivers that are going past that intersection. That's going to impact uh, communities. And local government support was a big part of our outreach before these signals were actually installed anywhere. And so we did actually reach out to a number of, of government agencies here in the Peoria area and surrounding areas before the project began. Um, and then working closely with them as we got ready to put these new traffic signals into use. Because very important, of course, to have the local government uh, support when you're doing projects like this and making sure that everybody is, uh, is on board with this before you go ahead and do it. In addition to that, presentations. Randy has made, I don't know, hundreds, thousands, Randy, a bunch of presentations to uh, different groups here and there and everywhere about the flashing yellow arrows, uh, you know, how they work, what they do, what it means to, to you as the driver, whatever it might be there. And this was done, as you can see there, both before they were installed and has been done since. And I'm guessing Randy will probably be doing these installations until he retires someday from IDOT. So we're getting the word out uh, through presentations. You see some of the groups there, you know, Lions Club, groups like that. Also, driver's ed classes. Of course, you want to make sure to get the information uh, in the hands of young drivers as well. And so Randy has talked with a number of those groups over the years and will continue to do so. So here's a look at a brochure that was developed there early on in the process. And this was just something, it is a ready reference for, for the public to take a look at and to just have handy to know how these signals work. Again, this was something new to the area. Uh, you, you don't just put something up and then hope people will get it. You want to make sure that beforehand they have a good working knowledge of how these signals work. And so this was just one other method that was used to try to get the information out. And as you look at your screen there, you can see there's some text information, some graphical information there. Tried to make it just as simple as possible. Uh, you know, here's how it works. You know, in each interval, it's it's got a little description there by it. The actual graphics of the arrows themselves, uh, themselves in sequence, showing how it would look when you encounter it at a traffic intersection, and then some of the benefits, of course, listed there on the left. So, one more way to get people some information about the flashing yellow arrow signals. Uh, a video has been something that has been used, video has been used at IDOT in various uh, efforts over the years, whether it's to announce new programs, whether it's to highlight certain things. In this case, the uh, flashing yellow arrow signals an opportunity to have a video to show people exactly how they work. And we would like to show you uh, the new flashing yellow arrow video that we have uh, right now. Making a left turn is getting easier and safer as the Illinois Department of Transportation installs a new kind of traffic signal across the state. Flashing yellow arrows are new to some drivers and may cause some confusion at first, but traffic engineers say ultimately they make more sense. Flashing yellow arrow indicates caution and indicates yielding, where before they had the circular green, which everywhere else means go, Randy Laninga is chair of the District 4 Illinois DOT Safety Committee. He led the effort to bring flashing yellow arrows to the state. In 2010, 100 intersections in the Peoria metropolitan area received the upgraded signal. Laninga hoped this pilot project would meet or beat the estimated 20% reduction in left turn crashes provided by the Crash Modification Factors Clearinghouse. To find out, the state of Illinois hired Bradley University researchers to study the impact of the conversion to flashing yellow arrows, analyze traffic crashes, and conduct traffic operation field studies. Well, that first year I only got about 17%, so I was a little bit concerned that it wasn't going as well as I thought. But after two years of data, that went up to 22%, and after a cumulative of three years, that went up to 26%. Safety is the number one priority for using flashing yellow arrows, and it's not the only benefit. A flashing yellow arrow can be used when a green circular signal cannot, which increases traffic flow and intersection capacity. A flashing yellow arrow means turn with caution. You must yield to oncoming traffic and pedestrians. A steady green arrow means turn left. A steady yellow arrow warns the signal is about to turn red and stop when you see a steady red arrow. Remember, flashing yellow means you must yield to oncoming traffic and pedestrians before turning. For more information, visit the Illinois Department of Transportation website.
Now we have some news releases that we uh, that we sent out uh, both before um, and then during the process of putting these signals out there. And really the idea of, of getting them out in advance was you know, like any other news release that we put out is you want to let people know what's going on. You want to give people an idea of what's going to be coming up, whether it's road construction or something else like that. But, uh, you know, got the news releases out in the uh, hands of the media who then spread it from there. We put it on our social media channels as well. Uh, inside the news release, there was a video link, also the graphic explaining very simply, again, how the yellow arrows work, the flashing yellow arrows work. That's an idea of one of the graphics that we threw into the uh, news releases there. And so really just saying, okay, here's what's coming up. Here's how these signals work. And then also mentioning these are the intersections where we're going to be. This is what's coming up. And really just trying to put out as much information and pertinent information to people in advance so they did have a good idea of what was going to be coming up in their communities. So the yellow arrows go in, and then what? Of course, there's going to be some media coverage of that. And we did receive quite a bit of coverage, actually, from the area news outlets. Uh, I would say some, probably most of the coverage was positive. And yeah, sure, there's some that maybe wasn't. There was a, an article or two that wasn't necessarily favorable. But I go back to what I said at the beginning. You put things out that are new, and not everybody's going to be on board right away. And so. Um, the positive coverage, again, very helpful and, and certainly appreciate our, uh, our partners in the area media community for helping us out with that. Many of those media reports actually had the link to the YouTube video right in it, so that was helpful to put the YouTube link uh, in the news release because a lot of times you'll see that those news releases are ended up just put in there verbatim uh, into the news articles. So we actually had a lot of hits on that YouTube video. It was one of our, our highest uh, videos there, the original that we put out uh, years back. Uh, in the years following uh, that release. Here's just some of the uh, ideas, or some of the examples, I should say, of media outlets that covered the flashing yellow arrows when they were installed. You can see a lot there in the Peoria area uh, in Galesburg as well, but there were other outlets statewide that covered this as well, and so we were happy with the coverage that we got, and again, the more you can do of that, the more people uh, can see it on the news, hear it on the radio, read it in the paper, and then at least there's that much more information out there where people are aware of what exactly flashing yellow arrows are. And so with, uh, with that, we do have continued efforts that we're going to be doing. Again, the video you just saw is, is brand new. Again, go to the, the IDOT YouTube channel. You'll see it on there. Um, and then we'll be promoting that, putting that out on social media, letting people know a little bit more about what these flashing yellow arrow signals are. Randy, I mentioned the presentations that he's going to continue to be doing. He'll be uh, taking that video with him, uh, using that as well, and then just really trying to get uh, the information out further as these flashing yellow arrow signals uh, continue. Thanks for your time, everyone. I'm going to pass it back here to Randy. Very good, folks. And as Randy uh, is about to take back and uh, do his wrap closing comments, I remind you to, if you have any questions, please put those into the question box. We've got a good number that are in there already. Uh, and we'll get to those here in just a few moments. I've also posted in the chat box a link to the YouTube video. About four minutes ago, IDOT released the YouTube version of the video that we were attempting to show. You can all go to YouTube and see that uh, in full, high quality, right from YouTube's site uh, when we're done here today. So Randy, I'll let you uh, finish this up. Thank you, Bill. So uh, what were some of the lessons learned um, as, we went, uh, as we went through this process? Uh, first of all, when we before we even started, we realized that you know this was a big change that we were trying here in Illinois, and uh, so we hired Bradley University through ICT to uh, to study the results, and uh, they did some prelim they actually did some preliminary studies, went out to the mall and so on, and and showed people what was going on and asking them what they would do with the flashing yellow arrow before we even put them up. And then six months after they were put up, they went out and did the same thing. And uh, I was amazed at how many people actually, even before they went up, understood uh, what to do at the, uh, at the flashing yellow arrow. But, you know, crashes was the big thing. So what did we find out about crashes? Well, um, we found about a 25% uh, reduction in per approach of the uh, 
type of crash, the left turn crash that we we're trying to avoid. And that's that person turning left in front of a through in front of through traffic. And I was very encouraged because you know at first we only that first year we only got a 17, 16 or 17 percent reduction in crashes. So I was a little concerned because I wanted it a little bit higher. And after two years, a cumulative of two years, that had jumped up to between 21 and 22 percent. And then after three years, it had gone up to 25 uh, percent. So that's really encouraging because, you know, as a safety person, sometimes you'll do a safety project and you'll see a big reduction in crashes right away. And then it'll, that reduction will slowly go go away as people get uh, get used to it. But this one just keeps on getting better, which is, uh, which is real encouraging. Also encouraging is the younger drivers. We took a look at the ages of between 6 and 24 and found out they actually over that first three years had a crash reduction of 36 percent. So that was uh, very encouraging. Not so encouraging was the older driver uh, crash reduction. There was really no significant change in the um, older driver crash reduction. Now, part of that is because there was actually very few of them to begin with. I was surprised. Older drivers were driving it pretty safe, and uh, so we didn't see any significant change in the uh, in the older driver reduction. And uh, in all, we saw a benefit to cost ratio of 19.8 to 1. So that was uh, also very encouraging. Now, when I started, we talked about those lead lag lefts. And so we tried them on Knoxville Avenue. And we took Knoxville Avenue out of the study because we knew this was, you know, this was something different we were going to do and we didn't want to include it in the main study. There's plenty of other intersections to look at. Well, we got a SCAT pro program. Uh, project, signal coordination and timing, and we allowed the consultant to put in the lead lag phasing. And it was amazing. We got great results with progression. We got rid of a couple stopped, increased the average speed through the corridor to about, of, uh, to about, by about five miles per hour. So we were very happy with that. But then we noticed at a couple of the intersections, we saw some crash increasing. Not all of them. Some of them, um, it, went, it went down or stayed the same. It was great. But there was two of them in particular that the crash, crashes went up. So we took a look at those two intersections. Well, the first thing we did was take the lead lag off of those two intersections. It was, it was uh, having a negative effect. So we took it off and we said, you know, what's the difference between these two intersections and the other intersections. And what we came up with was the one intersection was because it had negative offset lefts. And when I'm talking about poor sight distance, this is where this came into a effect. As you can see, the uh, left turn on the, uh, on the left there has a wide median. And so when cars are, as let's say that's northbound, in the northbound left turn, a car in the southbound left turn is going to block their view. All right? And so um, when you have this negative offset of your left turns and cars can block the other's view, you have that poor sight distance. And this is the intersection that the crash is really shot up. Because if they don't have that sight distance, they start looking back at the, the through signals and notice when that thing goes to yellow and just assume the opposing uh, traffic is going to be get, also be getting a yellow. And then they start taking off. And that's what was causing those left turn crashes. If now you see the intersection on the right, that has the skinny me median with uh, we're pushing those cars over to give them that better um, sight distance down the road. So where we had this positive offset left turns, we didn't have a problem um, going to the lead lag, but we did with a negative offset. 
Now the strange part is, is this picture on the right, even though it had a good positive offset, like a number of the other intersections, its crashes went up also a little bit. And that's because, as you can see, there's a big hill. As right after the intersection, we go down and you lose sight of those cars coming up the hill. So again, visibility is a big factor in, uh, in these left turn crashes. So I would just encourage as you go with the um, flashing yellow arrows, which really helped, also make, uh, get a good positive offset for your left turns to give them good visibility down the road so they can, uh, they can make that left turn safely. Oh, one, uh, another thing we noticed was our signs. When we started out, we had that sign on the left that says left turn yield on flashing, and then we had a symbol for the arrow, okay? And it was working out real well until the FHWA stepped in and said, wait a minute, that yellow arrow isn't an approved um, MUTCD uh, item, so you can't use it. So then we went to the sign there on the right where it's all words. As soon as we went to that sign, I started getting a bunch of calls of people not understanding the flashing yellow arrow. And uh, we kind of realized that the sign with the symbol really attracts their attention. When they see the flashing yellow arrow, all of a sudden that symbol on the sign says, oh, read me, I'll tell you what you have to do. Okay, if it's just a bunch of words, they're going to ignore it. So now all of our intersections, even though the feds don't participate in the signs, we've been going with the symbol. Now I do understand um, in the next MUTCD we should be seeing a symbol for that flashing yellow arrow. I've been around the country and noticed a lot of um, states are using not only the symbol but little lines, yellow lines coming out to indicate that it's flashing. So. Um, they're looking at what would be the best sign for this situation, so hopefully they'll come out with, uh, with one soon. And just a few other things, just like I said before, the older drivers is one of the big uh, things you have to outreach to. You got to make sure that um, uh, you get to some of their groups to help explain what's, what's going on. Uh, the other things about uh, training. As Paul noted, you know, there's a lot of wiring changes, programming changes needed for the flashing yellow arrows. So we made sure we got the manufacturers in here to help train all of our um, uh, so, uh, signal uh, maintainers. So all of our local electrical, um, uh, electrical guys who are going to be working on the traffic signals, making sure they got trained properly so if something went wrong they could fix it. When I started out, I, uh, I never thought about the vehicle code. The vehicle code has nothing about flashing yellow arrows. So we quickly uh, got our local uh, senator and representative and uh, we got that passed and the governor signed it so now the flashing yellow arrow is in the vehicle code. Um, I mentioned at the beginning the time of day operational changes, which is helpful. You can turn the flashing yellow arrow off and on depending on time of day, when you want it on and when you want it off, which has been uh, beneficial at a couple of our intersections. And then finally, um, uh, pedestrian crossings. We have a bike path that goes through one of our intersections. And the problem is, is the bike path comes out of some woods, and so you don't see that bicyclist till he's almost right at the intersection, or even the um, even the pedestrians. And we used to keep that walk um, every time the through movement, the main line was uh, green. We always had enough time because we were progressing that traffic to give them a walk and a don't walk. Well. The left turners were taking a look and saying, hey, it's clear for the pedestrians, and then they'd look down, find their gap, and start taking off. And just as they were starting to take off, a bicycle would fly through the intersection from uh, the other direction. 
And one of those bicyclists happened to be head of public works for Peoria. So we got a, a quick um, said, hey, we got to do something about that. So what we did is we made it by push button only. It doesn't come up automatically. They have to push the button. And when they do push the button, it disables the flashing yellow arrow. So when it comes through around to bring up the walk, for that phase, the flashing yellow arrow doesn't come up and allows the pedestrians and bicycles to cross um, without a conflict from the left turn. So that was another, uh, an, it's, it's not needed at every intersection. Um, this one was just a special case because it was a bike path with a lot of fast moving bicyclists, so we, we used it. We didn't use it anywhere else because we really, um, we haven't had any problem with, um, uh, with the pedestrian crossings and the people yielding to those, to those people also. Okay, uh, thank you very much. And with that, we'll turn it over to Bill for questions. Very good, Randy. Thank you very much. And uh, really thank you to Randy, Paul, and Brian for uh, great presentations today. I've got a good number of questions that have already come in. Uh, before we get into that, uh, I do want to remind folks, this is, this is actually the second in IDOT's webinar series. Uh, we've got a third coming up, Monday, December the 12th. 2016, uh, again at 1.30 Central Time. I'll put that registration link in the chat pod here in a bit for those who are interested, but uh, look for that. Their email invitations have gone out through the same channels already, uh, and I will get that link and, and put it out in the chat pod for everyone here in a, in a few moments. So I want to dive into to questions right now and, and have an opportunity to, uh, to answer your questions. And we got a good number of them in. So I'm going to start with questions for Randy. Uh, there's a good number of them uh, that came in for him. And let's, let's start with this first one. Uh, what specific pay items are needed to implement the flashing yellow arrow? Uh, well, you know what? I think I'm going to turn that one over to uh, to Paul, and uh, he can let you. He'll answer that one. We had a a pay item, as I talked about earlier, for modify existing signal head, which was to convert all the five section heads or four section with dual mode arrow to the flashing yellow arrow head. We had a pay item for cable, uh, cable and conduit, for the additional cables we needed to, uh, to rewire some of the heads or add additional side-mounted heads. We had pay item for sign panel, as Randy talked about, the need to get the right sign up there. And we had a pay item for modify existing controller cabinet. And we made that an all-inclusive pay item that included any additional load switches, relays, wiring of the cabinet, and uh, new controller if that was needed, and MMU, which we always needed, and wrote that generically enough that it would cover anybody's brand of equipment and everything that needed to be in there. And uh, that didn't change whether you were modifying one direction or four directions. Of course, the the uh, pay item for head would be an each pay item, and the cable would be a foot pay item. And then you'd probably also have some pay items for traffic control and, and mobilization. And I think that's it. Outstanding, Paul. There's a, a few more questions I know that would be uh, directed to you. So while you've got the mic, I'll let the, I'll fire a few of these off. One of them was there, Paul. Is there any consideration? for the timing used in the signal design, namely when a, a conflicting solid green ball comes up concurrently with an opposing flashing yellow arrow. Uh, in Indiana, there was a short delay that was added to emphasize that opposing through traffic has the right of way. Missouri also had something similar, but uh, we've not seen that in Illinois. Has there been any discussion of the timing change and some delay? We, we knew about those various things. Uh, we did not do that. For one thing, I don't know if that is consistent across all manufacturers' equipment that you can do it. 
and we had no guidance to tell us that that needed to be done, so we did not. Uh, and Randy's going to want to comment on that too. Um, I am on an NCHRP committee uh, looking at that right now. Because um, as you realize, the old way when the um, green arrow went out and went to a yellow arrow, it went straight to green. There was never an all red um, time because you couldn't go to a solid red with the through being green. And so there are actually some states that aren't using any all reds. And uh, we used them. We're using the all reds so when the green goes out, it goes to yellow and all red before flashing yellow arrows. But we're doing the standard amount. And uh, so hopefully this study that's going on right now will help give some direction on how to handle that. Very good. Randy, how about uh, information that questions come from some of the locals? Are there any specific state or federal programs available to the locals to make conversions uh, happen in their, in their local agency? Well, we used um, safety money on, on almost all of our projects. And so that would be definitely would be available is, uh, is to apply for the safety funds. Outstanding. Outstanding. A number of people are asking uh, about, you know, I haven't seen many in my area. Are they on their way? And it kind of ties in with another question that's out there about, you know, district forest plans. You know, is this a plan to deploy entirely within your district? Uh, and then beyond that, has there been any discussion more statewide about when flashing yellow arrow is going to be, you know, moving beyond District 4? Okay. In District 4, all of our state routes are now covered with flashing yellow arrows. The city of Peoria, on their signals, have uh, had has done a safety project and has installed quite a few. I know the city of Galesburg in our district is looking to change theirs out also. Um, one of the reasons we're having this webinar is to spread the news statewide. I have given a number of presentations on it, and I know there's a um, uh, champagne is has having a corridor put in. Springfield has a few corridors in, and um, a lot of these districts were kind of waiting on the conclusion of the study that just got done this year to make sure everything was working all right before they um, before they went on. Um, you know, I can't force anybody to do it, but the state policy now is going to be that we want flashing yellow arrows installed in new installations unless you have, you know, unless you can give a reason um, why you're not. And uh, you know, part of the problem, like Paul said, some districts don't have long enough mast arms. Where we spent maybe twelve to fifteen thousand per intersection, if you have to change out four mast arms, you know, you're going to be well over a hundred thousand. So the cost is going to be problematic for some areas also to get these in. Outstanding, Randy. How, a couple of uh, kind of operational questions. Uh, will the flashing yellow arrow allow for the use of permissive left turns on dual left turn lanes or at least permitted left turns for the left lane of the dual left turn lane? We have no plan to do that now. It's pretty much our, the state policy for a double left to have um, protected only phasing and we didn't change any of those out and don't have any uh, plan to now. There's just a lot of concern about trying to have two people turn left at the same time. It would be interesting logistically trying to get one lane flashing yellow arrow and the other red. I know Florida tried that out and, and pulled it out because it, it was not working well. So it's along the similar lines, if there's a dual left turn lane and the opposite direction has a single left turn lane, is this a location that's suitable for the flashing yellow arrow on the single side? I would think so, yes. Okay, yep. standing. 
Uh, and I'm not sure who the best person is to, to take this one on. Maybe it's Brian, but somebody had asked in the, uh, in the chat or the question pod, what is the age range for older drivers in the uh, crash reduction study? What, what defines somebody as an older driver, either as a target audience uh, or as, uh, you know, as studied to, uh, to make improvements in the study? In our study, um, it was anybody over the age of 65. Um, it was interesting when we were discussing that, the, uh, uh, some of the students said they thought it should be 60. And I said, wait a minute, I turn 60 next year, so I'm not an older driver, so we can't have that. As, uh, as, as a guy who just had a birthday not long ago, I can, uh, I can feel your pain there. <laughs> um, how about, uh, has there been any consideration of using flashing yellow arrow uh, for right turns crossing busy crosswalks or in areas with U-turn conflicts has been done in Wisconsin? Um, in District 4, uh, we uh, really don't have any of those uh, types of situation right now. Um, and we, you know, we're open and the MUTCD is open to the flashing yellow arrow being used for right turns. Uh, we just don't have any installed in District 4. Okay. I've got a, a question that's coming in. This is probably for, uh, for Brian. Uh, specifically, do you have to pay for media advertising, or what's the best way to get the word out, maybe in a low-cost or no-cost way? Well, sure. Uh, I mean, there's different ways to go about that. Uh, in our case, uh, no, we didn't pay for media advertising. We just went through our our local channels that we had uh, used in the past. Uh, you know, to develop a pretty good relationship with the local media here, and generally, they're they're fairly receptive to things that we put out. I understand that's not always the case in every media market, especially as you get into larger markets where there's a, a lot more stories to cover and things like that. Um, you could go that route, of course. You know, Again, just from our standpoint, we, we did not. We just did things like create our video. We did things like put out the news releases, Randy doing presentations, uh, social media. None of that came at any outside cost, uh, outside of just the time that we spent doing it. So um, it can be done without it. Could you? Of course, sure. Um, you know, there's any number of different studies on paid media and the effects that it can have on reach. But in our case, uh, we did not. Outstanding. Thanks, Brian. Uh, Paul, I got a couple of uh, detailed questions that came in here, and hopefully, I'll even be able to read them. Um, how does the flashing yellow arrow retrofit work on an intersection which utilizes four right turn only, four ped phases, and a four channel EVP? Can confirmation beacons be run outside of the MMU or what would a best practice be in accommodating the flashing yellow arrow? Uh, yeah, we had a couple of situations where we had to add an auxiliary load switch to the side of the cabinet specifically to run the EVPs. They do not need to be run through the MMU. They're just outputs the controller produces, so it's just a matter of wiring them off the backboard somehow. It can be a little problematic to have four right turn overlaps and four flashing yellow arrow left turns, especially with the Eagle setup, even with a 16 load bay back panel. Uh, it's a little, probably a little more technical than we want to get into right here, but you may not be able to have true combined overlaps. Awesome. How about, uh, Paul, can you talk a little bit about the uh, railroad preemption? Apparently in, in Macomb there's a, there's a railroad preemption, and how has that worked so far? Yeah, we've, that situation just came up about two years ago. We when we did the Macomb project, we worked with the uh, ICC and the manufacturer to come up with a system. We had a left turn that was going to cross the tracks, so in, during preemption, it had to go from green if it was in that state to red and flashing yellow arrow if it was in that state to red. And also, the thing the ICC really liked about it, then when the uh, train was going across the tracks, they were able to omit the left turn and show a red arrow while they were able to continue the through traffic moving parallel to the tracks, where in the past with the five section head, that green would still have been showing 
for the left turn, and they would have had to dealt, deal with it with a what they call a blank out sign, which comes up uh, no left turn while the trains are. So it really proved to be a real benefit in that case at, at the railroad crossing. Outstanding. And one last one for you, Paul, that I know is for you for sure. With the flashing yellow arrow and a four-channel EVP, uh, whereby preemption brings up and approaches green ball and green arrow, how have you avoided a case where preemption would create a yellow trap? What we required the manufacturers to do is take the intersection to all red. So if the flashing yellow arrow was up even in the direction that you wanted to go to green with green arrow, we went yellow, all red, and then went back to the uh, green arrow, green ball for that direction. Outstanding. I'm glad you're understanding these questions. My, uh, my civil engineering mind they had trouble reading through that and understanding what it was. So I'm glad we've got the experts on here. Uh, I, this one may be for Randy. I'm not quite sure, but we had a, somebody that had talking about their personal experience where yellow is the signal that universally indicates that the light is about to change to red. Uh, flashing red means to stop and go, right? And, and in Canada, the flashing yellow meant was about to turn red. And I, I just had done an international trip. I've seen, you know, internationally the whole bunch of different signal configurations. Uh, but psychologically, the yellow means, you know, time is running out. Uh, is there is there any, uh, is it, what, what is the decision that made flashing yellow arrow the preferred rather than red or, or another color? Uh, good question. It pretty much all came from that NCHRP report uh, where they did all the simulation studies and um, and found that most people, you know, the flashing yellow, you know, if it's circular yellow on a sign or anywhere else, always means caution. And the problem with the flashing red, and when we put the flashing reds here in Peoria, even with signs, there was a lot of people that just stopped and would not go. We couldn't get them to move through. And flashing red arrow is OK in the MUTCD if you have an indicate uh, location where you want. You have to have them stop first before they proceed through. And uh, so that can be used, but we turned our flashing red arrows to flashing yellow arrows because even after uh, five or six years, we still had a number of people stop there and wouldn't move. Um, so we've been we've been finding the flashing yellow arrow seems to be uh, well understood. Um, once in a while, you have a problem. We've had a couple of bad crashes, and one person had come up from Tennessee and had never seen it before. Uh, so it's not like it's never a problem. Um, but uh, it's, uh, it seems to be working, and it's what the NCHRP report said uh, and the MUTCD said we should use. Outstanding. <clears throat> Two more questions are, are in the queue, and, and Randy, they may both be for you, but we'll, uh, we'll read them off. This next one has a little bit of uh, you know, specific location detail, uh, and it's about uh, a person who's in Peoria area, and she turns right off of Knoxville onto Alta and keeps asking if she has the right-of-way when she's turning right onto Alta, and other cars who are approaching from the south are turning left onto Alta. She said that there are cars that you know keep turning in front of her that would have the flashing yellow arrow. They're honking and even maybe providing rude gestures. Uh, so the the question is, you know, has there been any study or or you know, what what can we do to manage to have accidents early on when we're looking for a behavior change and we're introducing that change? Have you noticed that any of those initial problems improve once people get used to things, or, or how are we managing that change? Boy, you got some tough questions here. Um, for that instance, yes, she is correct. As a right turner, she does have the, uh, have the right of way. Um, but I've noticed it's been a problem in Peoria, and we did have um, 
a person many years ago put a lot of yield signs up at right turns. And so there is a little mentality in Peoria where left turners have the right of way over right turners because they still remember those old yield signs that the right turner was supposed to yield. Um, many years ago, I took all of those out because it, it's uh, not, you know, not according to the MUTCD, and it gives a false impression. Um, and I don't know how to how to correct that or how to teach people that, um, but she does have a she does have a good point. Out, outstanding. Thanks for that uh, for the detail there. And this will be the last question we have in the uh, in the question pod, and then we'll wrap things up. Which is we we noted earlier, uh, Randy. I think you noted that there's an anticipated implementation of an IDOT policy uh, on flashing yellow arrow. Do we know the implementation date and schedule for that policy at this point? Uh, no, we don't. We're still in the draft phase, and. Uh, still has a lot of approval levels to get through before um, before it's finalized. All right. Well, one, right as I said the last one, another one snuck in, so let's, uh, let's grab this last question, then we'll wrap things up. When an approach has both green arrow and green ball, but then crosses the barrier, is there a solution to have the arrow and in circular indication time yellow and red at the same time. Traditionally, we program different yellow times between both phases. Uh, for five section heads, we use the yellow omit to prevent this from, from being shown. Yeah, um, we haven't done anything with that. Um, it, you know, because, yes, the clearance interval when you use leave the left turn phase and the and the uh, through phase, the yellow and all red are going to be a little bit different, but they are going to hit the barrier at the same time as far as the all red is concerned. Um, you know, we're talking about half a second, not much time, and we really haven't uh, seen or heard of any problem because of that. Outstanding. So with that, we'll, uh, we'll wrap up our session today, and I want to thank everyone for attending the webinar. In the chat pod, there are two links uh, that I've sent out. One is to the YouTube video that we had playing during this presentation. Again, you'll get a nice clean copy of that. The other one is the link to the next webinar, which is on pavement markings and the pavement marking management guide that IDOT has out there that's available for use. Uh, throughout the state of Illinois, including local agencies. If you have any questions on anything you heard about today, uh, please send an email to dot.bmpr.research at illinois.gov. We'll make sure to get that routed to the right person, get those questions answered for you. Our recording will be available in a, in a little over a week. Uh, we're going to have it closed captioned so it's uh, fully compliant for, uh, for those that need uh, additional service. We will get the PDH certificates out, as we mentioned at the beginning. Uh, so th this information will be viewable uh, through IDOT, and you'll be able to, to reach out through the website and get the information as you need. For those on the outreach side, you have the YouTube video, the, the longer version of the YouTube video that you can access today. And we will be generating a shorter public service announcement type video. It will also go out on the YouTube site, but you'll be able to reach out to IDOT to get a raw file for that. If you'd like to use it in your communications with maybe a local television or radio, uh, something like that, uh, uh, as a way to, to let folks know as you're introducing flashing yellow arrow in your area, uh, introducing that, what their behavior should be, or if you'd like to get that out to a driver's ed program or something like that in your area, we would appreciate any uh, further implementation you can do to, to help the, the YESH initiative that we have started here today. So with that, I thank you all for your time. Uh, appreciate your uh, sticking in through, uh, through a good presentations today. And we look forward to seeing you at the next webinar. Have a great day, everybody.